Hey guys, um, so when we read this week's Parsha, something really striking uh, for me was reading about the meeting between Yaakov and Esau. There's something you can really feel when reading it, and it's um, how nervous Yaakov is in anticipation of this meeting. He seems like he's really sweating it. He's preparing gifts, he's you know, separating the camp and doing all this stuff, and it makes sense, right? He's so uneasy. Who wouldn't be uneasy meeting up with someone who once wanted to kill you? Um, and so that would all make sense, except for that this story is coming right after the meeting with the angel. Yaakov went across the river on his own. He could have sent some slaves to bring some stuff from the other side. That's pretty brave. He's not nervous. And then he has a wrestling match with an angel, and he does pretty well. He was a serious match for a celestial being, and he walks away with relatively minor injuries. And he gets blessed, and, you know, Hashem has already blessed him before. What's he so nervous about? Does he think, you know, he's actually going to get killed? I heard... Uh, an amazing explanation from Rabbanit Yamima Mizrahi. She's a wonderful Torah teacher that goes around teaching Torah to women's groups. She said that the main source of unease in anyone's life is when someone's angry at you and you have bad relationships. And that, for me, really rang true. I sometimes just have this like bad feeling. I'll come home and I can't put my finger on why and I'll sit there and I'll talk with Jeremy. We'll kind of try to iron it out. I'll go through my day and I'll realize that I had some sort of encounter that was unpleasant. And even if I think I was right, just that feeling that someone's walking around mad at me saying, oh, that's stupid tequila. I just don't feel good. And when it's a serious conflict, it's even worse. Like when I'm at peace with Jeremy, I feel like we can conquer the world. We can literally conquer a mountain, right? But if we get in a fight, it weighs, it weighs on me. Or a conflict with a friend or a family member, I, I can't even sleep well. It's like I'm not open to other things, if certainly not spiritual pursuits, when my relationships aren't in order. Um, and so I think it's also expressed in the entire structure of the Torah. The whole book of Breshid of Genesis, it's like Hashem is catching us up on like everything that happened from the creation until the Exodus, right? Because the point is to get to Sinai, the Torah, right? And so you can't tell everything that's ever happened in the history of the world in a few chapters. So Hashem is giving us the central themes, right? And if you look at the structure of the book, it's so striking. After the garden, meaning pretty much when the world as we know it starts outside of paradise, what's the first story? Cain and Abel, brothers not getting along, brothers fighting. It's like that is the first human experience. And then the entire plot of Breshid has moved forward through conflicts between brothers. There's Yitzhak and Yishmael. They can't seem to get along. One of them has to be pushed away for the other one to flourish. Then there's Esau and Jacob, and Esau wants to kill Jacob. And then they make up, and then the children of Jacob are fighting. And what's the very last story of Genesis? The very, very end of Genesis is chapter 50. Jacob's died, and the brothers are so worried that Joseph's going to take revenge on them now that their father is dead. They're not sure. Maybe that forgiveness was you know, not sincere. Maybe it was just to comfort their father. So they beg Joseph for mercy, and he says, even though you intended me harm, Hashem intended it for the good. And he comforted them, and it says he spoke to their hearts. Like they had a real heart connection, finally, and they realized this is sincere. We're truly brothers, and we're completely at peace. And then he prophesies that... Hashem will redeem their children from Egypt. He says, God will surely remember you and bring you out of this land, right, out to the land that was promised to Avraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then it segues into the story of Exodus. It's hard to miss what Hashem is saying. And, you know, Jeremy has spoken a lot of times about building our ark, getting our home in order, you know, so you could face the challenges of life. The Jewish people were not ready to be a people. You know, they're not ready for the Exodus, for the covenant, until they got their home in order. It's the number one priority. So this idea of not getting along with another person as a major challenge to our well-being is here in this story. And, you know, it's interesting also that it's in the Hebrew language. Like, I bet you guys know, how do, how do people in Israel greet each other, right? We all say shalom. Shalom means hello and shalom means goodbye. Shalom means peace. It's like when you greet someone, you say peace, right? But what you might not know is that when you want to ask someone in Israel in Hebrew, how are you doing? Like, hey, how are you, man? Right? You say, Ma shlomcha, which literally doesn't mean, how are you? It means, how is your peace? Like the Hebrew language, the language of the Torah, is actually teaching us this. I think it's the only language in the world that does this. We have you know, 35 different countries here in the fellowship, so you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. But let's say in English, when you want to know how someone's doing, what do you say? You say, how are you? It's very you-focused. But in Hebrew, you say, how is your peace? Meaning, how are you getting along with the people around you? Are you at peace? Because... Right? The, the Hashem knows, the Torah knows that if you're not at peace, you're not going to be okay. So that's a really powerful lesson here, I think, that we see in this story. Um, and then going a little bit deeper, I think it connects to something that's, you know, th that really strikes me about this fellowship. Uh, because we know the Torah doesn't only guide us in our personal lives as individuals, but 
the, the stories, the characters of the Torah are also archetypes for our collective lives. And Jeremy might have mentioned this in the past. Um, you know, traditionally, emblematically, symbolically, Esav has been understood in the Jewish tradition as the Roman world, the Western world, the world of the church. And obviously, it's not talking about the exact offspring of Esav because no one knows who they are. But it's like that world of Rome and the church, they're, they're perceived as like, you know, the Jewish people always perceive them as like our brother, but a brother that's kind of scary. It's kind of Asaph like, right? There's like threatening, but still we have this kind of close sh shared experience. So I stumbled on the most amazing prophetic source of um, Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. He's known as the Nitziv. Um, he was one of the greatest 19th century Torah philosophers, uh, Torah you know, um, uh, uh, scholars in Eastern Europe. And he looks at chapter 33, verse four, and he notices something really interesting. There's all these words about Asaph right? Being really active in reaching out to Yaakov. It says, he ran, he hugs, he falls on his neck, he kisses him. And then, and then it says, they both cried, right? Like Jacob had done a lot of actions, but they were all kind of cold and calculated. You know, they were like setting up the camp and giving the gifts and praying, but there's no emotion towards Asaph. Um, uh, but then when Asaph reaches out to him, it's very one-sided, right? He's doing all of the emotional kind of contact. They don't really connect because when there's fear, it's really hard for you to open your heart, right? It took a lot of actions on Asaph's part to open up Yaakov's heart. But then in the end, it works. They cry together. And then Nitzi brings this amazing prophetic vision for the future. If I hadn't read it with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe it because he's writing this 150 years ago, way before any of the amazing processes and awakenings that we've all been seeing in our you know, recent times. He says, and I'm going to translate, translate from Hebrew really carefully to not miss it. He says that this is to teach that Yaakov was awakened in love for Esau so that it will be in future generations that when the children of Esau come with a pure spirit to recognize the children of Jacob in their place, the children of Jacob too will awaken and recognize the place of Asav and say, you are my brother, right? And it's like amazing, that blew my mind when I read that because it's like the biblical blueprint had it all here. A lot of our you know, non-Jewish friends come and say, you know, like we're really reaching out to Jewish people and, and sometimes like it's met with a little bit of fear, a little bit of suspicion, are you trying to change me? Are you trying to missionize me? But the Nitzim is teaching us that when somebody comes with a pure heart, and when people come with a pure heart, it doesn't always feel like it's being met with like this simultaneous sign of love, but sometimes it takes a little while. Um, you know, and I really feel that here in our fellowship. It's like maybe a first step towards bringing that prophetic vision alive, right? Like, you know, people coming together and reaching out and in a sense, crying together. You know, when Jacob's crying, it's not like he's crying because he's sad, right? He's been through so many sad things in his life and he doesn't cry. He's crying out of this place of emotion, like, oh my gosh, we're brothers. I can't believe it's taken us so long to remember that. Um, so I, I really uh, found that inspiring for what we're doing here in this fellowship, uh, kind of crying out together, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we've forgotten for so long that we're brothers, but now we can come together and learn Torah now that we've, you know, iron like you know, take now that we're taking first steps with pure hearts to try to iron out this relationship, we can come and and you know try to be brothers and sisters again. So that really spoke to me on a personal and collective level. I hope to you guys too. Wishing you guys a great week. Bye. Shalom. My name is Jeremy Gimpel. A few months ago, we started an online seminar teaching life-changing biblical wisdom revealed from the original Hebrew and straight from the mountains of Judea. With global instability on the rise, more and more people are turning to God, realizing now they don't exactly know where to look for guidance. The Bible says the guidance will come from the land of Israel. What started as an online seminar has grown into a global fellowship with hundreds of members from over 30 countries. We are participating in fulfilling prophecy as we learn the Bible through the eyes of prophecy with a focus on what it's telling about us in our lives today. What you will discover is that the wisdom transmitted thousands of years ago is speaking directly to us in our time right now. Instead of learning the Bible as a religion, it's the Torah of Israel, the living guidance of God. So please join us for our next online gathering and get access to the full library of teachings that the Land of Israel Fellowship is offering. Join now and get an audio series on the prophecy encoded in the book of Joshua, absolutely for free. Just click on the link below or email fellowship at thelandofisrael.com. I don't know how you found this video or what compelled you to click on that link, but I don't believe in coincidence. And I would encourage you to take the next step on your journey toward the land of Israel. I hope to see you at the Land of Israel Fellowship. Shalom.